upon them out of heaven until water dropped. All right, let's go. Verse 12. Well, verse 11. It was told David that Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones. Everyone say the bones. But notice whose bones they are. The bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan. Where the Philistines had hanged them, then the Philistines, when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa, and he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged, and the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin and Zelah in the, sep in the sepulcher of Kish his father, and they performed all the king commanded. Now here it is. Everyone say, after that. God was entreated for the land after that i'm going to talk to you for a little bit today about burying the bones would you lift your hands would you lift your hearts and let's pray together father we thank you lord for your word today we pray that the living word will preach the written word help me to speak as an oracle of the lord Help us to speak corporately, but also let it speak individually to us. God, I pray today that there would be immense healing that would be released, that the blessing can be unlocked, that the rain can fall, that the harvest can come, and that the giants that still roam in our lands may be killed, that a generation can be released from the shadow of Saul, and that we can walk in the light of David. We bind every resisting spirit in Jesus' name, and we pray your perfect will will be done. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I bless you in the name of the Lord. Amen. And if you love Jesus, would you clap your hands one more time to him as you're being seated? Would you clap like you mean it? Would you clap like you're filled with the Holy Ghost, that you've been touched by the power of God? Would you clap like you know restoration is here? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What miracles we have seen. What testimonies do we have? Now, obviously, there is a huge contrast between David and Saul. And Saul has been dead, as far as I can tell, about 30 years. So why is Saul suddenly being brought into the scenario? Why is it suddenly what Saul did having any bearing on David's administration. The Bible says there was a famine. First year, well, maybe it's just a cycle. Maybe it's just something in, you know, this year we just didn't get the rain. Nobody prays about it. Nobody thinks that much about it. A second year, they're doing everything else to figure out what it is. They're using all the solutions that they have. Nothing. Second year. The third year, it's now starting to get desperate. Three years without a harvest, all your reserves are gone. Now you're getting to a crisis. This could shut down the entire economy. This could make them weak before their enemies. This could do a lot of things to destroy every bit of progress that was made in this administration of David. David has expanded the borders to the prophecies that were given to Joshua. It was David that finally expanded them and finished all of those prophetic words three times the size of what it was when he took that nation. It was, it was Saul that shrunk the borders of Israel by one-third. So David has taken back land and now expanded everything that God said he was going to give it to them from the river to the great sea. He got it all. And now it's threatening everything everything there's no future if there's no harvest so finally he stops and he says okay god i think you're trying to get our attention what is going on why is there no rain why is there a famine what is the cause of this this is what leaders have to do we have to stop and start asking why is there something that i have missed here in this scenario that suddenly is stopping up the heavens and god says it's for saul and it's for his bloody house it's because he tried to kill the gibeonites now i start doing research show me where in all of the chapters 
that mentions Saul, and there's a lot. Show me one place where it's mentioned where Saul was trying to kill the Gibeonites. You see him trying to kill a lot of people. He kills all the priests at Nob. He tries to kill David. He throws a javelin at his own son. But I can't find it. It's not in the record. But yet it was something that as soon as God said it, David immediately knew. It was something that everyone in his ministration had an understanding of. And so what he's saying is there's things that never made it on the record that everybody knows about, but nobody's talked about. And a generation later, you are reaping the results. You are feeling the impact. And God says, I'm stopping everything until you deal with this. We all have a story of stuff that never got on the record. That was never officially dealt with. That for whatever reason, the optics were wrong. It could damage too many people. We could never say it publicly. And what happens, it surfaces in a newspaper article somewhere. It surfaces on Facebook somewhere. It, it surfaces in somebody's lawsuit. And we could talk about the Catholics and all their lawsuits. And you could talk about Jim Baker. And you could talk about a lot of other names, Jimmy Swaggart or whatever, that were really high-profile things. But guess what? It's in every denomination. It's in every network. It's in every movement. There's stuff that never made it on the record that everybody knows about that nobody can talk about. And what it does is it begins to put things together that are not supposed to be put together. There begins to be a transfer. You see, David is sitting on the throne of Israel. Well, Saul sat on the throne of Israel. He's supposed to represent the nation of Israel. Well, just like Saul represented the nation of Israel. And after a while, if nobody deals with this, how can I tell as a Gibeonite if David is not the same as Saul? I start transferring things that, I had, that, that David had nothing to do with, but because he never had any part of healing the process, now becomes responsible. Let me give you an example. I have a series called Strategies for a Total Recovery. That's real positive, don't you think? That's a wonderful title to put on a series, Strategies for a Total Recovery. I was at the airport, and my baggage was like a pound over, you know. And they're like, you have to take something out of your bag. And so I'm unzipping my bag, and one of those series fell out. And the guy behind the desk doesn't know who I am, doesn't know anything. And he goes, oh, recovery program, that's awesome. He goes, tell me about it. And I said, well, I said, this is a, this is a message about restoration and, and taking back things that have been stolen from your life and how God restores you. And as soon as I said the word God, he goes, oh, yeah, hell, fire, and brimstone, and I'm a sinner on my way to hell right now, yeah. And I was like, you got hell, fire, judgment, brimstone, condemnation from strategies from a total recovery. Like, like, he made the jump that fast. And the reason why is because it was an association. As soon as I said God, or as soon as I say I'm a preacher, immediately it goes back to some other tragedy, some other story, some other offense, some other thing that was wrong, that was off the record, but everybody knows about, and it's now living in the consciousness of people a generation later. And we're saying, God, we want revival. God, we want the rain. God, we want the harvest. God, we want you to do this work. And God is saying, I'm going to shut it all down. Until you are willing to step into this gap and fix this offense. And deal with what is in the culture. Now, David was a victim himself. 
David had also been persecuted for doing the right thing. Think about it. Saul didn't want to kill the giant. He didn't want to take the risk. He's the tallest. He's the leader. He should have been the one out there fighting Goliath. But, you know, I, I feel today that it would be too much of a risk upon the administration for someone as noble as I to go out there and fight with Goliath. So I'll tell you what, I'll make whoever wants to go and fight tax-free, and you can marry my daughter. <laughs> now, I know that they didn't speak with an English accent, but that's how I hear it in my head. I always listen to Alexander Scorby's version of the Bible, so everything comes out with an English accent. <laughs> and on the 14th day of the fourth month. You know, the... <laughs> but David goes out there with a rag and a rock and, take, and kills Goliath. I mean, he's just anointed and crazy. He's out there, yeah, I can do it. And so, as you would expect, everyone's excited about it. They start having celebrations. I mean, they were almost slaves to, to the Philistines. And so, they start having uh, all the women come out, you know, and Saul's already married. He's already in midlife, you know. David's a teenager. <laughs> you know, they're marching. Everyone's marching. This is David's first parade. You know, he's smiling. You know, he's like, hey, how you doing? You know, the women are singing, you know. Saul is slaying his thousands, and the girls are going, ten thousands for David. He's like, ah, oh, that's awesome. But Saul is feeling intimidated now. He's feeling overwhelmed now because he couldn't believe this kid went and killed a, a, a giant that he was afraid of, and now everybody's celebrating. And so, you know, Abner's next to him, and they're marching, you know. Saul is slaying his thousands, and David is ten thousands, and oh, oh, they're marching, you know. And he's like, what's that other part, Abner? What's that part about David? Oh, your majesty, they're saying Saul is slaying his thousands. Yeah, I heard that part. What's that other part? Oh, yeah, I, I can't quite hear you very well, your majesty. He doesn't want to tell him. <laughs> he finds out later what it is. He's like, what else can he have but the kingdom? You know. Now, Saul shows his personality, shows his control, it shows his insecurity. It shows all of this breaking down of his relationship with Samuel. It shows all of these things because God has already told him the kingdom was going to be rent from him. And God's going to give it to somebody else. And so he immediately sees David. And now David's a threat. Really, he was making his kingdom better he was making everything everything is smoother now that the giant is gone everyone's in great spirits and great all he would have had to do is say yes yes i gave him permission <laughs> that's all he has to do isn't he awesome it's great now his daughter likes him now his son likes him now everybody likes him and this is this is too much for him so now he becomes a threat david experienced that he went through all of that he knew what that felt like. He had 10 years of running from Saul. So he wanted to be the opposite of Saul. And you see that all through his administration, that he does the exact opposite of what Saul would do. Even when Absalom came and he was obviously wrong, he just abdicates because I'm not having this. I'll let God reinstate me. I, I, we're not having a war. I'm not fighting with my own son. So this is what God says, because you are intimately acquainted with it, because you understand it, and because I have anointed you for this hour, I'm giving this to you to deal with. I believe there has to be someone in this hour that can stand on the stage of the world and say, we are here to say enough is enough. We understand it. God has anointed us for this hour, and we want to speak life and restoration and healing, and we are ready to have the hard conversations, and we are ready to ask the question, what is it going to take to fix this? It was a broken covenant. There was a covenant with the Gibeonites. They were deceitful, yes, but they made a covenant. And you know what happened? They became proselyte Israelites. And so they made them the helpers of the Levites. They hewed the wood and they carried the water. 
They were the support system of the Levites now. And Saul said, they're not like us. Let's kill them. Anything that's not like us has got to die. If you're not a pure Hebrew, you should not be here. And of his zeal for Israel, his zeal for everything. And sometimes the mistakes that are made are honest mistakes based upon our zeal and our desire for everything to be pure and everything to be just right and for there to be no lies. Well, you know what? That was a lie. They lied us, so that covenant is invalid. No, a covenant was still a covenant, and God honored that covenant. And because of this now, there is a breach. And so God says, you have to bring the Gibeonites. They have never been dealt with. 30 years. They've just been waiting for their turn. He restored Mephibosheth. They've already seen that example. David's a restorer. We never got our audience. We never got our moment. There's something in this generation right now that has to be approached, that has to be dealt with, that has to be finally brought to the surface where someone will acknowledge the stuff that never got on the record. And so David arranges the meeting. What's it going to take? We don't want money. Money's not going to fix this, they said. So this is what we see in the world right now. Reparations is just give people a bunch of money. But he says money is not going to fix this. And they said we don't really want to kill anybody else because someone was trying to kill us. But we do want the next generation of Saul to die what they were saying is we don't want this to be perpetuated we want you to do something to make sure that we're the last ones that ever have to deal with that spirit so we want to make sure it's not perpetuated into the next generation and David said we'll do it some things have to die in order for there to be a restoration. Some things have to be addressed before things can really be healed. And so we have to determine that we will never act that way again. Maybe we did act that way 30 years ago. Maybe that was our approach. Maybe we were a little bit too zealous. Maybe we were too a little aggressive. Maybe there was some double standards there that a lot of people saw that publicly you were this way and then behind the scenes you were that way. Everybody knows that you were throwing javelins over here. Everyone knows you had an evil spirit. Everyone knows you and the prophet didn't get along. And so now you're getting up there acting all zealous, going to try to kill Gibeonites. Hey, hey, Saul, this does not really match. Somebody somewhere has to say, okay, I understand that. I know why they did it. I realize he was insecure, but we're going to get over all those insecurities. We're not going to act like this anymore. We're not going to function this way anymore. We're going to operate in integrity, and we're going to be inclusive enough that even if people don't all look just like us or act like us, if they want to serve, you know what we're going to do? We're going to find a way to get them in the covenant because if I can get you into the covenant, you know what? After a while, you'll just become a part of us and you'll just be exactly what God intended you to be. And he treated them with the same respect as any other Israelite because they had now become a part of the covenant. He did not treat them as a half citizen. What will it take? What will it take? And this is what he says, we need atonement and we need you to bless. We need atonement and we need you to bless. So the one that was offended, the one that was hurt, has the secret of the blessing. And this is where David's being a man after God's own heart cause something extraordinary to happen. This is what we want. We just don't want to perpetuate it. Okay. Now, this creates another set of problems. There are seven sons that are going to die now. And as far as Rizpah is concerned, they did nothing wrong. So now we have a current situation where somebody is trying to fix something from the past that was wrong. And now... There's something being done by David that now looks to be 
handled inappropriately. Why is my son having to die? Why is my family being affected by this? What did we do? Just because we're related to Saul, you're going to make us guilty by association? Look, it's complicated. Oh, you can save Mephibosheth. Yes, I have a covenant with Mephibosheth. But this has got to happen. And so now, Rizpah is feeling the pain of loss because of something that Saul did, and she was not even actually a wife. She was a concubine. But those were still her boys, and she still feels it. While we are trying to address issues, a lot of times there are other casualties involved. And that's part of the reason why it wasn't on the record in the first place. Is because we were trying to keep there from being more fallout, more issues, more problems, and more knowledge of what happened. And yet, all of that has to be dealt with at some point. And so it was at the beginning of barley harvest. This is our springtime. Barley harvest is our springtime. And she waits. And she beats off the birds. And she sends the beasts away. And she lays on a rock. And for five months, those bodies just decompose. But she says, I'm going to keep them intact. I'm going to keep their... I'm going to keep them from being torn apart. I'm going to keep their face, their identity as long as possible. I'm going to keep a remnant as long as possible. I'm not going to let anything happen. I'm going to beat it off because in her mind, they still deserve to have some kind of a respectable burial and everyone just forgot about them. The rain cannot fall until the bones are buried. The rain doesn't fall when they're hung up before the Lord. The rain falls when they start taking them down. Because not only do we have to deal with the past, we also have to deal with our present. Reparations had to be made for what happened in Saul's administration, and David have to, had to give those boys a respectable burial. And Rizba was fighting for it. She was fighting for it. She was not giving up. This cannot, if you're saying this can't repeat, well then guess what? I'm going to be here so it's not repeated. Because if these bodies are just left here, everybody walks by, it's still the reproach of yesterday, and it's still a mark on the administration right now. We're still ignoring things. You can't ignore these boys now. I made a, a new uh, commitment this year to myself that I would let pain be my teacher. We often try to run away from the pain. Somebody told David, hey, she's still out there. What? After all these months, she's still out there. You know why it's important now? Because this is when the early rains are supposed to fall. The early rains come in the fall. And if the early rains don't come, then you plant seed. But when the latter rains come in the springtime, in early, what we would call wintertime, around February, they would wash all the seed out again. So they're just getting ready. And God, is the famine really going to be over? Is the rain really going to come? Hey, Rizpah is still out there. And you know what they found out? There was still an open-ended conversation about Saul because he never got a proper burial. Do you realize they never got to grieve Saul? They never got to grieve Jonathan because the Philistines took their bodies. It was a small group of men that went and got those bones off the wall and buried them, but Israel never got to mourn Saul. And so because it's an open loop in their mind, they never got closure. The spirit of Saul is still in the land. It is still overshadowing everything. 30 years later, the influence of Saul, the bloody house of Saul, the culture of Saul, the mentality of Saul 
David is still working against it. He's still trying to go upstream. Nobody is killing any more giants. Nobody is having the spirit of David on them. There's four more giants out there. Nobody has permission to pick up, listen to me, the spirit of David because the spirit of Saul is still living in their consciousness. What we have today is there's this awesome, incredible movement. There is this powerful apostolic movement. In spite of all of this that's going on, David is still expanding the land. He's still uh, creating the tabernacle of David. He's changing the whole priestly order. There's 24 hours of prayer uh, and, and, and celebration that's going on. He has a totally new approach to God, and God sanctions it and honors it. And even Amos, he says, God's going to restore the tabernacle, not of Moses, but the tabernacle of David. This is something prophetic and historic. It's Acts 15, that all the Gentiles will seek my face, all because of what God is doing with David and this tabernacle. Yet, God shut it all down, because you got to deal with this to have all the rest. With all the progress that we have made, I believe that there's been a stopping point right now in the body of Christ where God is saying, I want to take you to your destiny. I want to release the final decade. I want your last 30 years to 40 years, David. I want this to be the greatest and the best. There's something that I want to release, but we have to settle all of these issues right now, and we need to bury some bones so we can have permission to go on. So, so it wasn't just the boys. It's Saul and Jonathan. Now, I love this. It did not require all of Israel to assemble. It required a remnant that were well-trained, that were obeying the principle that, the, that David sent them out to do. It was the king's men. It was his closest men that went and did this. He gave them instructions. Go get those bones and you bring those bones together, and then you take these bones, and you give this, these sons of Saul an honorable burial. They get to be buried with Saul. They get the burial of Jonathan. They get the association of royalty. They get the full honor that is due to them, regardless of what they did or what they said or what they were a part of. You know what? We're still going to give honor. We're still going to give respect, and we're going to give them a good burial. And in giving them a burial, the Bible says that she stayed there until water dropped. That means when they started taking those bones now, they were no longer flesh. After five months, it's just bones. As they start taking those bones down, the heavens start to open, and God says, all right, the prayers can start getting through now because we are closing this loop. We are getting closure on the past. We are finally healing the real issue. We are truly getting down to what's been wrong. We've addressed it, and now it's time for us to see a wave of healing and restoration come into the body of Christ. We are here today as a remnant. This conference is a remnant. It doesn't take the entire United Pentecostal Church. It doesn't take the entire uh, Christian movement. It doesn't take uh, apostolics all around the world. It just takes remnants. And if we as a remnant today can say, we'll stand in that gap. We as a remnant today can say, you know what? We're going to be a part of this. We'll take it upon ourselves. I believe the reason why we're here is because we've seen the wounds. We've seen the offenses. We've experienced the double standard. We know how it's hurt our prodigals, how it's affected our families. We know how it's affected our churches, and yet our heart is still after God. Our desire is still for a move of God. We want to do it right. We want to love people the way Jesus loves. We know this has been around, and so it's time to destroy that spirit, to take the spirit of Saul out so that the spirit of David can live. Would you clap your hands to the Lord if you believe that right now? Hallelujah. 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 Well, give me about five more minutes and then we're going to pray some prayers together, okay? Let me just wrap this. So there were three things that happened when they buried the bones. So I'm going to tell you the results and then we're going to do it, okay? The first thing is the rains began. The rains began. God was entreated for the land. 
That means all the prayers that they were praying up to this point did not get through. They'd been praying for rain for three years. Oh, God, send the rain. He's going, "Mm mm-hmm. We'll get to that in a little bit. A few other prayers you need to pray first. Oh, God, what about the harvest, Lord? Oh, God, we're trying to plant seed again. You know this is how we live, God. You understand? We're your people. Yes, I know you're the people, but there's a few issues that you're ignoring here. But when they got honest and got real and allowed God to speak to them, they made atonement. And now, Gibeon is starting to bless. Bless you, David. Bless you. Our hearts are healed now. Thank you for that. I, I, I can't tell you what it means to our family. I can't tell you what it means to us that somebody finally talked about this. I can't tell you what this means, David. I just, you have my loyalty forever. We're, we'll serve forever. Thank, thank you so much. I, I, I know it's painful for everybody, but we've had this pain for decades. And now it's going to get healed. And so thank you, David. Thank you, David. Now here come the bodies. Let's give them a proper burial. Wait, there's one more part. Wait, we got to bury this now. We got to bury it. We have to get some finality to it. We have to show everyone. Now it has to be a public display that we have to do this together and we have to bury it. And God says, all right, now you can pray and I'll hear you. God is entreated for the land. Number one thing happens, rain. Rain is the guarantee that the seed will be received in the soil. You cannot have seed in the soil without rain if you're going to have a harvest. Second thing that happens is that as a result of the rain, they start having harvest again. That's the second. But the third was something that nobody expected, was a byproduct that actually had even more impact than the first two. The spirit of Saul in the background of their minds, suddenly went away. That voice in their head suddenly silenced. You see, because of his insecurity, he pushed down anyone that didn't have what he had. What, anybody that wasn't as good as Saul could be around him. Anybody had anything better than Saul? He's trying to kill him. So no matter how many gifts you had, no matter the talents you have, everyone's afraid to do anything, afraid to try. Everyone's intimidated and insecure, and, and they're living under the shadow. And now that David's king, well, we're glad he's king. At least he's not going to try to hurt us. But nobody is stepping out. Nobody is, is doing anything. He's got 30 men that he's got that are extraordinary warriors. Besides that, the rest of Israel still has the shadow over them that's kind of oppressing them, that's kind of pulling them down. And, and they're constantly intimidated, constantly afraid constantly insecure because that shadow of Saul and when they buried him it dawned on them he's not here anymore Saul's really gone David's really our king we have permission to grieve we have permission to release we have permission to go on hey wait a minute hey wait a minute we can celebrate David now we can officially celebrate David hey he was a giant killer all of a sudden, they start talking about David, and they start celebrating David. And the next thing you know, people start talking about, hey, I heard there's a couple more giants out there. And David goes, I'll show you how to do it, guys. I'll go out there, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to kill that Ishbi, Benim Bob. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to show you I still got what it takes to kill giants. Come on, let's go get some giants. And they go out there, and Ishbi Benibob, he'd been waiting a while for this one. He had a brand new sword, and the Bible says he wounded him. He wounded David and knocked him down. And somebody stepped in and said, come on, you're going to fight an old man. Come on, why don't you fight with somebody that's a real warrior? Stepped up and just killed him like it was no big deal. All right, David, now come on. And he's dead. Come on, you don't get to go to war anymore. And they carry him back. <laughs> but look what they said. Lest the candle of Israel go out. Look, you are now the light of Israel. So they have moved from the shadow of Saul, and now they're living in the light of David. Now, 
The light of David gives me permission to think big. The light of David gives me permission to say, I can kill a giant. The light of David says, I can be a man after God's own heart. The light of David says, I can do anything. The light of David says, hey, even a servant can kill. Servants start, no name people start coming out and killing giants. They all start taking turns. Who wants him? Who wants him? You want him? You want him? I, I want him. I want him. I'm going to go. Come on, let's go get this guy. And they just start wiping out giants. Can I tell you the shadow of Saul? It's time for it to go away. And it's time for us to live in the light of David. You know, part of the reason why you're honoring, you're honoring your heritage here, we're living in the light of G.A. Mangan. We're living in the light of Anthony and Mickey Mangan. We're living in the light of Vesta Mangan. We're living in the light of these people that are constantly saying, you can do it, you can go. Oh, yes, the reason why POA is POA is because you have the light that is shining on you that says anything is possible. I'm living in the shadow of so many elders, of so many great men. But you know what? It's not a shadow anymore. It's now light that inspires me, that says, hey, if they did it, I can do it. It is time for us to have permission to dream. It's time for us to have permission to war. It's time for this generation coming up. If we won't empower them, the world has a space for them. So we have to fix this so we can have a future. So these are the three things that happen when we bury the bones. The, the rain comes, the harvest comes, and we walk in the light, live in the light of David, and we raise up a generation of giant killers. So today, I think we, we need to bury the bones. Let's do this together. This is something that I've done several times now. But it's something that I feel as part of the restorative anointing that we're operating in here in this conference and something that our church is trying to take that intercessor role in. And that is identification repentance. What identification repentance is, is what David did. He didn't do any of those things, but he took it upon himself and took responsibility for those things and repented on behalf of Saul because Saul couldn't, and because Saul wouldn't. So I would like to do that today. I would like to start it. So I'm going to get on my knees today. If you have any family members, if you have people in your church, people that have been in your life, somewhere in your history, or maybe you personally have been hurt by a preacher, if you've been hurt, by someone who meant well, who was zealous. If I've ever done anything to you, if I've ever said something or done something that somehow damaged your faith in any way, would you please forgive us? Would you please forgive me? On behalf of preachers that have meant well, on behalf of elders that have meant well, and sometimes people that didn't mean well, that were just toxic, and people were hurt in the house of the Lord. They said things that sometimes it's true what they said. Sometimes it was a lie what they said. But it hurt either way. If you've been hurt, your family's been hurt. And you're carrying that around. You said it's never been dealt with. It's never been talked about. No one's ever acknowledged it. The church had to be right. The pastor had to be right. We always had to protect the... But you knew about it. Today, would you forgive us? Would you forgive the church? Would you forgive the ministry? Would you not hold this against God? And today, and we take all of these things that have been behind the scenes that have festered and brought awareness, consciousness, and association that put Saul's brand on David, that put all of this toxicity that's around the church and put it on apostolic. 
and anything that we have done, we have to somehow, Father, today, we have to somehow release it. So I'm asking you as a church and as a people to forgive us, please. And I want to talk to God about it. And if you will join me at this, however you feel to. Lord Jesus, I know there's so much more that you have for us. There's so many prophecies that you've given to us of a billions, billions of soul revival about a harvest that's greater than any harvest that's ever happened in the world. God, we want to see our sons being giant killers, our daughters rising up, being awesomely used and greatly used of God. We want the rains to fall. We need the rain so desperately, God. We want the harvest, Lord. And Lord, if we are the remnant, if we are from your house, oh God, that you have vested us with this responsibility to heal this wound and be repairers of the, of the gap and make up that hedge, we ask you to forgive. We want to identify anything that's in us that's wrong. And we want to take collectively as Daniel repented for all of his people. And you heard him as one man for all of Israel. So Lord, hear us as though we would pray for the whole body of Christ right now. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Unto us belongs confusion of faces. Unto us. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Forgive us of all the things that have never been dealt with. Forgive us for the perversity. Forgive us for the corruption. Forgive us, Lord Jesus. Forgive us, oh God, for all of the insecurity that made us hurt others that you had sent to help us. Forgive us, Lord, for all the sons and daughters that have been wounded through the years, for all the saints that have left, for all the people that are out there because they had a bad experience somewhere in the church. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me for anything that I have done or I have said that's been a part of that. Oh, God, we heard from Dr. Banks today about getting down to get as low as you are, to get as humble as you are, oh, God. Today we take these times, these moments, and we ask for forgiveness. We ask for forgiveness in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. I know I haven't always got it right. I haven't handled everyone perfectly. I haven't always had the right response. I haven't always loved people perfectly. But oh God, forgive us. Now I want you to stop right now before it becomes too much. And I want you just to lift your hands now and I want you to thank the Lord that he's heard our prayer. Would you do that? Would you just lift your hands up now and would you thank him that he's heard our prayer today? Thank you God for hearing us today. We look to a different tree today. We look to the tree that Jesus died on today. We look to that cross where Jesus took all of our infirmities, all of our sicknesses. He took all of our sins and all of our offenses. We look to that cross where he is our atonement today. Let's clap our hands and thank the Lord that he's our atonement today. All right, let's do some business together. This is a part of burying the bones. Now, would you stand with me, everybody, together? 
We're going to pray three prayers together right now, okay? We just prayed an amazing prayer. Thank you so much for getting on your knees and for opening up your spirits. Thank you for that. We did this a little bit yesterday. We're going to do this in unison today. And even if it doesn't apply to you right now, it's a good exercise, okay? So take your hands again like this. Just open your hands. And just, if you want to just whisper it, you don't have to say it loud. But I just want you to repeat after me. This is just a short prayer of release. Lord Jesus, we release every person, whether in the church or out of the church, that has hurt us, that has hurt me, or hurt my family, or people that I love. Not by my strength, but by your strength, I forgive. And I release them right now in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord, that as I forgive, I am being forgiven. <laughs> and everything that I have done, you will hear that prayer to wash me and cleanse me and forgive me. Now I want you to just lift your hands up to him and thank him that he's heard that. Now, Satan, you have no right to hold on any person that is in this room or represented by those that are in this room. You have heard the prayer that they have prayed. It is a legal binding document in heaven. It is bound in heaven because it has been bound on the earth. A prayer of release and forgiveness has happened today in this moment. And so take your hands off of every family. Take your hands off of every person that is in this room or represented by this prayer who is watching even online. Father, by the authority of your word, we remove the power of the offense in the name of Jesus. All right, clap your hands to the Lord and give Him praise right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right, before we take the next step, how many of you felt something lift off of you when we prayed those prayers? Did you feel that? How many sensed something even beyond this building be released in this place? All right. The second prayer is for rain and harvest they go together that's the second prayer now we can pray it with authority now we can pray it with effectiveness how many churches are represented here today i know i know we if you're if you're not from from the pentecostal of alexandria raise your hand if you're not wow look at how many hands are raised wow so people from all across the united states are here today so we're not just praying for this location. We're praying for all of the churches that are represented here today that God's going to send rain and God's going to send a harvest because we have buried the bones today. And a part of that restoration is our prodigals coming home. That's a part of the rain. The rain restores the ground and the seed produces the harvest. Are you ready to pray it? Let's pray it together. By the authority of the Word of God and by the power that's in the name of Jesus, I release the rain, the early rain and the latter rain together. Oh God, so the seed can be sown and the harvest can be reaped. We thank you, God, that the rain, oh God, is going to refresh and renew and bring an end to the famine and usher in a new time. A new season, a new day, oh God, of outpourings and demonstration of the Spirit of God with power. I release it in the name of Jesus for every church. I release it in the name of Jesus for the United States. I release it all around the world in this generation at the rain, that you will release the rain. Oh, God, and we thank you for harvest. I thank you, God, for harvest. I thank you for prodigals coming home. I thank you, God, that nothing can stop the prayers now, that our prayers can be entreated. You will be entreated for the land. If my people will, I will. I will heal the land. Heal our land with the rain. And release the harvest. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.
All right, clap your hands to the Lord if you believe it, if you know that God heard you. All right. This is the final prayer for me tonight. I don't know what else is going to happen, but this is my final prayer with this. And this is to release a new anointing upon this generation. That this is a new era for us. The shadow of Saul is finally gone. The bones have been buried. Our full potential can be realized. We have not even touched our potential. There are so many prophecies that are over us. There are so many things that are hovering over this movement, that are hovering over this generation. It's time right now for a fresh anointing to come for giant killers to be awakened and for us to take on the real enemies, not having to fight with one another anymore, not having to battle amongst ourselves. There's no more conflict with Saul and David. That's all gone now. We're one body. We're one people. We're all united. We have the same goal. We have the same desire. And now we can start killing these giants that have been roaming our land and start conquering some serious territory and winning some serious souls. So if you're ready for this, I want you to be representative. If we were representative in our repentance, we can be representative in praying this prayer for this generation. And if you're ready to see a giant killer generation rise up, if you're ready for the spirit of David to be released, if you're ready for all the promises that are written in the book for these last days, I want you to step out of your seats right now. I want you to come and stand. Hallelujah. 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 And we're going to release it. We're going to release it. We've had to look backwards. And what you've been doing with Hope Conference has been repairing and restoring and renewing so that we have the privilege to start looking forward. Hope is always anchored in tomorrow. Hope is always anchored in tomorrow. So it's time to end this conference releasing hope, releasing the prophetic, releasing our anticipation and expectation of what God is about to do, that we're walking into the greatest harvest, the greatest anointing, and our prodigals are going to be right by our sides while we do it. Are you ready? If you're standing with somebody that you know and you want to agree with them, go ahead and connect with them. If you don't know them, just raise your hands and let's pray together. Father, by the authority of the Word of God, I speak today as an oracle of the Lord of what you have foreordained before the foundation of the world for 2021 and 2022 for this decade this decade rather I thank you the alpha cities will be reached I thank you Lord for hundreds of thousands and millions of souls I thank you God that millions will be billions I thank you God you have a generation that you are raising up I thank you God the devil has been defeated that today the spirit of offense has been broken. Today, all of the strongholds, all of the darkness, all of the things lingering in the background, they have all been canceled. They have all been shut down. And now you are entreated. You are entreated for the land. And now you will heal our land. You will heal our divisions. You will heal our breaches. Your breaches. You will heal our gaps. You will bring us together in the spirit. You will pour out the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain together. Lord Jesus, you will release the blessing. You will release the promise. You will release the prophecy. You will release every utterance, every word, everything that has been prayed. Oh God, I release it over this generation. I speak a fresh revelation. I speak the spirit of David. I speak it in the name of Jesus. A giant killer spirit is coming upon this generation right now. A fresh wave. A fresh wave. A fresh wave. A fresh wave of the anointing. A new inspiration. Leaders we haven't even heard of are going to start emerging. People that we didn't even know anything about are suddenly coming to the top. There's going to be saints that are going to start doing extraordinary things. God is taking the limits off right now in the name of Jesus. We are releasing it. You are the remnant. You are the ones that God has called at this conference at this time to open the heavens. Hallelujah. And we thank you that our prodigals are coming home. We thank you that our prodigals are going to fight right alongside of us. The prodigals are going to pick up the swords and run right into that battle. 
And everything that we have believed for, everything that we have waited for. Hallelujah. 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 All right, let's clap our hands one more time to the Lord. Give him praise in Jesus' name. He's such an awesome God. Hallelujah. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can you breathe the breath? Can you breathe the air? Can you feel the fresh, refreshing? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I think we have to close it out. As we heard today from Bishop Mangan, we, we prayed the prayer. We have to close it out with a praise. So I don't know what you got up there, but let's close it out with a praise. Thank you. That was a fabulous message, people, right there. You won't hear a better message than that message right there. I want you to listen to me when I said, when I walked back to Mickey and I sat down by her, I said, the gift of faith is in this room. So we don't need to just pray and praise. You need to believe what the man just spoke from the word of God. And faith is in this place for you to claim and believe whatever you want. God's going to answer it. So when you walk out of here, don't let anything attack your faith. That's what I feel led to tell you. Don't let anything attack your faith. Your prodigal's coming home. And when I spoke, your prodigal's not just coming home. Your prodigal's going to be used in ministry. The gift of faith is in this room. Let your faith operate. In the name of Jesus. All right, you heard it. Lift your hands across this building right now. Praise Him with all of your heart. And while you're praising, miracles can happen. While you're praising, God's going to heal you. God's going to restore you. While you're praising, He's going to confirm it. While you're praising right now, God's going to give you vision. While you're praising, God's going to open up your ears to hear the voice of God. Woo. Come on and lead us in a celebration. Thank you so much. We're going to just walk in this and operate in this. Let the spirit flow. If you'll open up your spirit, there'll be a river that'll start flowing right now.